This is the Power to Podcast, show 137. Played a pivotal role in shaping the person I am today. The dedication and the hard work instilled in your classroom have made all my achievements possible. During my final round of interviews, the interviewers were amazed at how quickly I breezed through the mental math in business problems, proudly showing off my ability to solve them faster and more accurately than anyone else. The abacus and the skill I acquired during my childhood strengthened my com- commitment to focus, hard work, and made working with the numbers second nature to me. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Erman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, the Mental Math Machine Rogers. Matt, I don't think I have ever had more fun recording this podcast than I did today, and also a little bit more under pressure than uh, than we were today. I, I will tell you, there is not many times that this podcast has said, okay, you should pause and move over to the visual version of this. But um, yeah, I... I got a 99%, uh, still an acceptable grade from our sensei, which uh, I'll appreciate and I'll be totally fine with. Yes. Yeah, so we had on um, a guest who goes by sensei. She is, as she talks about in the beginning of the show, she was born and raised in Japan for 31 years, moved here, and she brought with her a traditional way of learning math using an abacus. And yes, we are talking about an abacus. Not the one I think you would visualize because when she shows it to us about 30, so it's probably going to be about 35 minutes into the show, it looked much different than what I have ever seen. And even when I Googled it while we were recording. Um, So like Matt said, when we get to that segment, we will say stop and go to the video or jot down the time and jump over to YouTube when you get home, if you're listening to this as you drive. Uh, But she, she talks about how she teaches math, how she learned math and how she brought it to the States. And now runs a school which, um, which is empowering students to be good math students. And we talk a lot about the logic of math, the patterns in math, and, and building students' confidence. But it was really eye-opening to different strategies that are out there. And just her system of the abacus, I've, we found fascinating because she gave us a lesson on well, it. Well, I think that we've, I know we've reflected in the past of how it feels like some of those primarily elementary grades while super critical the main purpose of those uh, grades is to teach students how to do school and unfortunately a lot of times we do that through experiences but also rote memorization and saying it's just kind of how you do it um here are numbers, you need to memorize those numbers, here are letters and basic words and and those type features. And there's definitely some understanding behind that. But unfortunately, sometimes we get in this rut of this is just how it is, you move on. And then when we get into those upper grades, you start learning real content. And what she kind of identified was students that were struggling with number sense we're looking to continue the tactile learning of ancient strategies of logic and number sense as a tried and true method um, to really understand the value and how you could use a base 10 system through this uh, thing that we've all probably seen and said, I can tell you what that is, but I can't tell you how to use it. Um, So, I mean, I, we've had incredible guests and we've learned so much, but I don't know if we have ever learned as much in a short amount of time than we have from this episode about something 
uh, totally unique and unfamiliar to us. So it was fascinating. Yeah, honestly, I don't really have anything to add other than I think our audience is absolutely going to love this episode. You're going to gain a lot, not just in learning what this advocate system is and how she teaches and how she uses it, but a, a real reminder of good instructional practices, more specifically related to math, but it's still applicable to any subject area. So let's jump right into that conversation with me walking. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Miwaka. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We are really excited to have you join us today. So to kick things off for us, introduce yourself to our audience. Let us know where you are coming from and give us your unique perspective and connection to education. Okay, thank you. Yes, my name is Miwako Sakabayashi. My student and my student parents, they called me Sensei Miwako. Sensei is not my name. The Sensei means a teacher in Japanese. So they call me Sensei, Sensei, Sensei. So sometimes Sensei became my middle name, but <laughs> my name is Miwako Sakabayashi. And then, uh, yes, I'm from Japan. I am Japanese and I was born and raised in Japan until I came here 32 years ago. After a long time, I said, well, I wanted to see something. So I just popped into the Portland, Oregon. That is a place I came in 31 years ago without expecting anything. Even I did not know my life would be living in here. But then 23 years ago, I started to teaching abacus, which I learned when I was in Japan. And then myself, almost half century ago, I'm 58 years old. So 50 years ago, I became really uh, fascinating about abacus. And then very fortunately, my hard work started, you know, like, a, you know, blossoming. And then I started winning the city competition, regional and the state and the national. So I just, you know, threw out every, almost every year, every month, I go to the, you know, competition. I got, the, you know, like a win the competition. And then... That was my highlight, but then I even didn't think I'm going to teach, but I loved abacus. Now here I am. I have been teaching almost 23 years, over over a thousand of the people. The youngest is a four years old. Oldest student was a 76 years old to, you know, teaching the abacus. And then, you know, like a, I have my own school to teach but i also sometimes i'm invited by the university and the college and the high school middle school elementary school everywhere wherever i go I, you know whatever people ask i just go there to you know like uh, teaching them and showing them sharing my skill to do so now my student uh the one became a highlight then you know like uh, uh last month we had a regional contest, Abacus competition, and then competing with a Seattle student and the Calgary, Canada, and my student, Portland, Oregon. Yes, we won the school award, and I'm very proud of my student. And also, uh, August 13th, we have a national Abacus competition. So my, I think seven students are going, and I'm really excited my student will get some you know big trophies so that's all that is a one where i am that is awesome so all i know about abacus is the tool that exists existed i think hundreds of years ago for i know it as a accounting tool or what predated calculators that's that is all i know about an abacus i have never seen an abacus in my actual real life i've never touched one I have no idea how they work. And I don't even know if your system of Abacus is related to that tool. So please tell us what Abacus is. I am really excited to hear this because out of everything that I've taught in elementary school, every subject, I love teaching math the most. I love building students' confidence in math and building their, um, 
their confidence in problem solving and their understanding of how and why things work and, and creating that deep understanding through exploration. So I am really excited to hear what Abacus is and, and how this impacts students' ability in math. So Abacus is, like everybody said, I know Abacus, but I really don't know Abacus. That is a people's you know, reaction. Abacus is as some people said, oh yeah, I know those are colorful bears. That is to me, the city abacus. That's not the abacus, what we are teaching. Abacus is a rectangle. And then sometimes you see at the antique shop, you know, two top bees and the five bottom bees. That is a Chinese abacus. What we teach is one top bees and the four bottom bees. That's the abacus I have been teaching. And the abacus is the one, well, abacus, how, how that works. And we have already calculated why we need it. But the abacus is ancient calculator. You just have to understand how to move the bees. And then they will be teaching you addition, subtraction, and the multiplication is, as you know, the repeated addition and the division is the repeated subtraction. That's four basic calculation can be done with the abacus. Top of it, biggest secret is you do not even need abacus to calculate. Many people said, why you need abacus? We already have a calculator. But my objection is, okay, but if you do not have a calculator, can you calculate? No. But the abacus, once you really learn and train yourself, you even do not need the actual abacus to carry along. Abacus will be ingrained to your brain. And then that's how you can just, you know, start it using it. It's to me, is a second language of the numbers. That is abacus. That is abacus. So, and, and Matt, I, I will let you talk, but even just one thing that you said was a common phrase in my classroom, multiplication is repeated addition. I would take my students through activities for them to understand that, to understand that multiplication is repeated addition. And, and when they see that understanding, then it becomes less challenging. Addition is repeated counting. So I would take them through number line activities and things like that to, to build that understanding. So I'm, I'm already, I'm already, uh, I'm already uh, getting into this conversation. Sorry, Matt. No, I was just going to say, I, uh, I had a new math program that they delivered a um, non-traditional abacus to my classroom, but didn't clarify why we should have it. And so like most teachers, it was out for display, but was it used? And it, we were told that those number skills that the, I love the second language of numbers through Abacus. I think that's a fascinating way to put it. Um, can you kind of speak to how, I guess, you uh, put that in front of kids at first so that they start developing an understanding of that language? To me, I have taught many age of the children and then, of course, as you know, younger student has no expectation. They're just diving in. But as you know, sometimes I have a student, third, fourth, fifth, maybe sometimes six, seven, eight grader who are kind of already way behind, way behind the student coming to my classroom. And the first things I notice is they do not have even confidence. And then they hate math, right? And why that happened? Because they just don't like to seeing the numbers, even without doing anything. So then what we are going to start approaching is just showing them the very simple calculation, which is like a two plus one or two plus two or five plus four using the abacus. Abacus good things is they see the actual bees and we using our actual hands, fingers, and the touch it, sense it, right? So it's very tactile. They see it, they move it. It's not like a thinking to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, something is an un existing things to, you know, like a think of. Abacus is actual bees. And then you're using your, your own hands and look at the numerical numbers to move the bees, that became connecting the letter two became the two bees up. That's how it started to connecting. Without knowing, you know, it's the same language, 
but it is the same language. Like I'm Japanese, I speak Japanese. You are, you know, American, you speak English. Is that something different? No, we just have a you know, different, you know, like a background. So same thing, letter two, and the two B is up. Maybe I should say, whenever I look at the numbers, letters, I, whenever I really have to think, I have to corrugate that the letter became the B's. But again, most of the people, you are, you are including yourself, you are not introduced. So that's why for you, two is a two. But the, to me, or including my all my student, two is a B's. You know, five is a B's, four is a B's. So that's how we are introduced, started introducing the children, another language. So it seems as though this is to really help them build a foundational understanding of number sense and computations with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. How does, how does this extend beyond that, if it does? So how does a student that, that builds this foundation of number sense benefit long-term in terms of their ability to succeed with mathematical concepts as they surpass those basic operations? That's a great, you know, like a question. You know, as I have a student, you know, when the new student parents, you know, prospect parents comes and they always ask, do you teach algebra? Do you teach, you know, like a, you know, like a, like a, like a, it's any kind of high math. Do you teach? I said, no, I don't teach. But surprisingly, surprisingly, the children who has a basic stronger foundation, the building up the confidence, and then they already know the basic. Once they know the basic, the, what they needed to do is just, you know, take it off those, you know, harder part. You know, like a calculation is the most basic things, no matter which area you go. But then what I realize is many people even do not have the basic skills. If you don't have the basic skill, how are you going to learn the next step? So me, myself, last 23 years, I have been observing the student. Like I said to you, I don't teach higher math or any, you know. Yes, I, I can just relate it to teaching them this math, algebra, you know, like a fraction. Because a fraction is a, you know, for different formation of the division, right? Decimal is just a base point is a different. But once children understand that those basic, very strong foundation build it up, they know how they can start applying themselves because they have a confidence and then they have to have, you know, extra space to thinking about to how, you know, more monitor the program to understand to, you know, like how they can, you know, like, you know, apply to it. In fact, I have so many students, they are way, they coming into the, you know, average of the student, by the time they going to the, you know, six months, you know, uh, practice training and a year after two years and three years, their grade will be just, you know, stepping up, sec you know, two grades up, three, three grades up, and then, they feel good about themselves, I believe. So then, you know, what they, I think that is everybody. If you feel good about themselves, they are going out of the box. They are, you know, right? They don't really limit themselves to, you know, like not to stop what they are. They are really recognizing themselves. I can do this. Oh, this is easy. And then they're just moving on forward instead of, you know, timid themselves. I don't know how to do this. I cannot do this. That's what to me, I, I observe myself. I think that like, I was um, trying to make a uh, connection to uh, ELA, uh, language arts, Ken. Um, when you said a two, we read a two as a two and you visualize it as two as well as the beads and those type features. And there's, portions of language that are really difficult to define you just kind of use them and you generally know how to use them based off context clues like the word and and but and or obviously conjunctions but they also are 
just situationally based that you just use them and through whether it's rote memorization or the basics of language you just identify as that is used here kind of like the number this figure that we've created means a value and they often talk about the curse of knowledge at least i i heard that a lot when in my pre-service training as one of the hardest parts is when you know something you just expect others to know it and it's really difficult in the role of teachers to say well it's obvious because you know it but they may not and so what i like this is easy you can do it, it might yeah. not be easy yeah absolutely and what i what i feel like in math specifically and your work um kind of goes in line with really understanding the value of numbers in many 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 environments so that whether it's confidence or they know in the, they know compared to a lot of kids that going through math just say the name of without really understanding definitely makes sense why when you go into complex problems why they're going to be more successful because if i can't if i can tell you that a three is a three and a seven's a seven but i struggle to visualize what that really means of course later on with more complex math that's going to be really difficult and I love how you mentioned the tactile feature of Abacus to be the language, the understanding, the physical movement that represents the size of a number. I just find that really fascinating. You know, Matt, can I just add up? As you're talking, I really pixelized this specific student. Like I said, sometimes I have a six, seven, eight student, you know, grader came to my class. And then, uh, like I, 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 you know, they when I evaluate their calculation skill was almost nearly first to second grader. Eighth grader, to me, it was shocked. How that happened? Why? It's not the you know kids' problem. It's just, unfortunately the school system just you know pushing up. Okay, when you're done first grader, just going to the second, the third, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight. And when they really started feeling something really wrong, and then boom, and then parents started looking for something else to you know try to you know. But like I said to you earlier, when I saw those students, they just like uh, they uh, fear. I can feel whole body. They have a fear of the numbers. It's not the math. It's just they have a fear. And then they just, you know, started to just using those just the bees to connect, looking at the letters, looking at the bees, touching your own finger to move the bees. That started to connecting them. That connection is started to building up slowly, building up their confidence. Oh, I can do it. And then usually they quickly, you can see their smiling face. You know, like a wow, I said, I did it. You know, once those is coming out, now they are on their way to, you know, they can moving themselves. That is to me is the first biggest happiest moment. I'm really glad that those kids came to me. And then usually once they started taking off, no one, no one cannot stop. They will just, you know, take off, right? Yeah, totally. Well, and I think even even young kids and kindergarten teachers, I mean, Ken, I'm sure you've seen counting bears or those blocks that we use. Um, that is so integrated in early learning that I think has similar values to Abacus, maybe a little bit less uh, uh, systematic, like it, it doesn't grow with them. But there's a, a cutoff where you move away from the kinesthetic features the physical hands on and you just assume you know as a fourth grade teacher for nine years i if they didn't understand that seven meant seven i struggled with that and i didn't make as much time as i should have not to put you on blast ken but 
we've been talking about my transition from fourth to fifth grade and, and the value of something like calculators. And I remember something that stuck with me. Ken, you said, if a kid could answer one of my questions using a calculator, was that a question worth asking? And I think it's a really valuable thing if we have tools that could spit out the numbers, was that a valuable question to ask? Yeah, you can do some lower end questions, warm up the brain, you know, make sure everyone has what they need. But our whole goal is to use math in real world environments how we would need to, whether that's measurement or, you know, numerically for values when we're shopping or the engineering features. And I think the more that you understand what those numbers actually represent, not just dictate, is the value of, of your work, which I think is really and cool. It's a, it's a deep understanding of the patterns that exist in math. And I don't want this to sound like I am knocking elementary teachers in any way, because I am not, and I come from that world. We are tasked with teaching every subject. We are tasked with teaching kindergarten one year, fourth grade the next year, differentiating for such a vast uh, uh, difference in learners, as well as the community and the culture of the classroom and, and all of those hats that teachers have to wear. But I think there is a, a large majority of a lack of a deep understanding of the patterns that exist in math and how when students understand them, it changes their ability to solve future problems and to learn future competencies in math. And so actually the way, so when I first started teaching fifth grade, I taught math to three homerooms. So I taught math most of the day. And every year I thought of this on the fly, my first year teaching, and I ran with it every year. The first lesson of my class was they came in, they worked in groups and I challenged them with, I want you to come up with a mathematical question that a kindergartner through senior has the ability to solve. And also a kindergartner through a senior will be challenged by one mathematical question that any student in this entire district has the ability to solve, but will also be challenged by the same problem. And so the kids are coming up with like number sentences and word problems and, and all these things. And I say, well, can a kindergarten solve that? And I, or can you solve that? Not really. Well, then a kindergartner can't solve that. Or a kindergartner can solve that. Well, then how is that going to be challenging for a senior? So I revealed the question at the end of the class. The question is why? You add why to any mathematical question, and now it is still something that you can solve, but it becomes challenging. And my message to the students was, I am going to push you, and I'm also going to support you to understand why these patterns exist. Why, when I tell you this is how you do this process, why this process works, and how the number, the logic of numbers builds up to this capacity. So simple things like when it became time to teaching multi-digit addition with decimals involved, the students should, or, you know, that's a broad term, but should come into my fifth grade class with the ability to add multi-digit numbers. So when I taught that lesson as a class, we would go through and write the steps of, mul of adding multi-digit problems. And they would say things like line up the ones place, right? And, and, do, and start, in, start in the ones. So then I would add in decimals and I would just say, it's the rule is not start in the one. Sorry, your second grade teacher taught you wrong. The rule is start in the lowest place value. The rule is, is line up the place values, right? So just changing those phrases and getting them to realize it's the same exact process that they already know. The decimal does nothing other than make it really easy to line up the place values or uh, division of larger numbers. Do you know how to divide single digit? Great. Then you know how to divide larger. Figure it out. The pattern doesn't change. Getting students to see and feel those patterns that exist in math, when they understand why, then you can show them the shortcut. Then you can show them the tricks. Then you can give them the calculator. Because if that calculator is gone, like you said, when the abacus is gone, they still know how to do it. When the calculator is gone or when they forget the trick, Remember why, 
Remember how you came to that shortcut. And then you'll say, oh, right. That's the, they'll remember those shortcuts. So they'll be confident in knowing that the shortcut they're using, they haven't used in a while is the right thing to do. And, and so that's, that's what I love about what you're saying is you're developing that deep understanding of logic and numbers and recognizing the patterns. And that is what's going to make them successful when they hit algebra, when they hit calculus, because it's still the same thing. It's rules that apply based on patterns. There's a reason that shortcut works. Like when I would teach algebra to students, I would say there's one rule you can't break. Whatever you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other. You could just add 25 to both sides of the equation if you feel like it. It's not going to help you get to X, but you can do it. You're not breaking the rule. It's the only rule that you can't, that you can't break. So I want to try to visualize this abacus a little bit more. So I want to see if this works in an audio fashion, but can you describe to us how many beads are on, how many rows there are, and how many beads are on each. I'm going to kind of like write this down on a piece of paper as you describe it. And then I want to try to go through just a basic addition, subtraction problem to visualize how this abacus works. Do you think we can do that? Yeah, of course. Okay. By the way, before that, I just wanted to add it up something. In the traditional school, I mean, like not the, I mean, like Japan, you know, America, Europe, or whatever you go, Math calculator, calculation is if you have to add 4,321 plus 1,111, you're always going to the ones, tens, hundred, and thousand, right? If you are calculating 1,378,279 plus 3 million, blah, 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 what you do is you're always calculating from the ones, tens, hundred, thousand, right? Abacus, we don't do that. We do the way how you read the numbers. We calculate the way how you write the numbers. So let's say if you, if I'm going to tell you 48 plus 59, your mind is going to do 8 plus 9. And then you're cutting up and then 1 plus 4 plus 5. That's what you do. No, we do 48 and 59 that's just we are calculating from the top tens first and the ones so that's why our mental calculation works because if you have thousand if you're calculating from the bottom to up by some you're coming up you already forgot everything okay but anyway okay so now i think instead i rather using the fingers if it is okay. I, th I don't think our, you know, like our audience cannot see, but maybe you can also explain the way. So I want you to put out your hands out like a rock, okay? okay. So then index finger out, this is one. And the middle finger out, two. And the ring finger, three. And then four, five. There's no finger below here, right? The below the pink, you know, pinky. So you mm -hmm. have to close it and the thumbs up. So what do you think of this thumb is a five? So five and the one. Five and the one is a six. And mm -hmm. the, Matt, you already got it. Five and yep. the two, seven and the eight and the nine. So make zero. Okay, ready? So now I'm going to give you the numbers. What I want you to do is don't use your old traditional calculator, which you already ingrained in your head. I want you to just listen my voice, move open, close, open, close your finger. Are you ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm intimidated with... a little bit. <laughs> okay. No, don't worry. I'm going to go slow. Start with three. Three, visa, three fingers out, right? Take away mm -hmm. one. One fingers in. Plus two. Two fingers out. Take away three, three fingers in. So how much, how many finger left? One. Means one. So that's what you already calculated. Okay, let's go. Make zero. Start with five. Top is up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Plus one. Plus one. Take away two. Plus four. Take away three. Plus one. How much now? Then we have eight. Seven. 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 Ooh. So did you even think to calculate? No. Mm -hmm. You just move the fingers. So abacus bees is the same. So abacus is Ken and Matt. The top bees is only one bees. 
That's why I, I represent only thumbs up, one beat.、Mm-hmm. Top is only one beat, bottom is four beats. The finger is representing the four, right? Four. So, abacus is a one top beat and the four bottom beats. How many? It depending on the abacus, sometimes smaller abacus, but usually now standard is 23 digits, 23 lines. So, that means you can calculate up to the 23 digits. Okay. But so, there's all... 23 beads on each row? No. The each row is a five beads, one top、mm-hmm. beads, four. So, five beads in each row for 23. Ken, I don't know if you, so I said eight because we're so used to seeing a thumb and two fingers representing exactly that, that I'm like, oh, this is naturally eight, although,、right. you know, five, six, seven. Wow. Maybe、okay. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you this so that maybe you understand. So,、okay. for, our, for our listeners,、uh, hopefully you were following. I would along, highly encourage、cool. you.、Uh, yeah, I would highly encourage you for our listeners. If you're on Spotify, you can just. Uh, go to the video portion of this. Our, our shows are video on Spotify. If you're listening, timestamp where you're at right now. I'd love to tell you, but we haven't done our intro yet. So it's going to be about 35 ish. Timestamp this, jump over to YouTube and、yeah. watch so you can follow along with, with what's going on right now. All right, continue. So this is Abacus. You see the top、mm-hmm. one, one top beast and the four bottom beast. Yes. But if you are using the Abacus, We're going to do this is ones and tens and a hundred, thousand, you know,、mm. ten thousand, and blah, 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 blah. And then this side will be the decimal. Okay. okay? So,、yep. but instead, like I told you earlier, because of this hand is belonging to you, you just have to move yourself. So now、mm-hmm. I wanted to use the both hands out. Both、right. hands out. Okay, ready, for ready? This, Matt? Are you ready? I'm so, ready. You can think one side is ones,、mm-hmm. one side is tens, right? So you、mm-hmm. can think, okay, ones and tens, right? So let's go two plus two plus 40, 40 in the another hand. So right now it's a 44, right? 44. Minus 31. Take away three in tens, one in. From ones. So right now、yeah. you have a 13, right? Maybe I should do this way 13, okay? Plus 25. 25. So how much right now here?、Mm-hmm. 38. 38. Right? Yeah. Okay? Make a zero. So now, now you know the how to simple, no cutting and no boring calculation. But now I'm going to give you the cutting. Are you ready? Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh uh. Uh uh. <laughs> But it's going to be fun. It's really fun.、Yeah. I really want you to learn this and I want you to teach. This is my goal. Let's go. Start with a four. Four out. So now, if I'm going to ask you to add nine, can you add? You only have a five. You cannot、mm-hmm. add. How about this? Can you add a seven? No. You cannot add a seven here because you only have five. Can you、mm-hmm. add eight? You cannot add eight.、Mm-hmm. The only number you can add is 10, right?、Mm-hmm. So, what are you going to do? If you have to add the 10 instead of the nine, how much you have to subtract? One, One.、Mm-hmm. and then、yeah. 10, right?、Yep. So, our answer is 13. So, now you have 13 plus eight. Can you add eight in three ones? No. Then you have to take away two, add one. And add one. Oh,、right? boy. Okay, that makes、Get、sense.、Mm-hmm. Now you have a 21 and a minus five. Can you take away five from one?、Mm-hmm. No. Nope. Take away 10. And add five. Add five. Answer、yeah. is 16. Right? Wow. Okay. Very simple. What I, when I'm teaching the children, Sometimes, especially when the older kids are coming to my class, they are so much you know, ingrained, so many different ideas. But I always said, like I explained to you earlier, if you already have a nine, can you add any numbers? No, you already filled up. The only number you can add is 10. That's it.、Mm-hmm. 
So if you're going to add one, how much you have to take away? Nine, add a 10. If you have to add eight, how much you have to take away? Two, Two. add a 10. Yeah. If you're going to add four, take away six, add a 10. That's a very simple thing. So then that mm -hmm. is ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, moving on each quorum. We do the same action. It's just a different point. And it explains, it explains why you bought right. it. it. Right. Explains, so now you go to pen and paper and you can you show the process of borrowing. You are explaining why that exists. And and it's funny. So you're you're what you're describing and, and you said in the beginning of the show is you're teaching ancient an ancient way of, of doing math. And I don't know how much you've seen this over the last six, seven years in education, but there's all of this backlash from parents, really of, of our generation, Matt, maybe about 10, another 10 years older saying, why are kids learning math this way? What's up with this new math? Why can't they just learn it the way I learned it, where I memorized everything? And I'll never forget, I was in a, a parent night with our math supervisor who is a, he's, has I, I love, I've always loved working with him because he has a true deep understanding of, of again, all the things that I've, I've said here today. And he said the best way to get those parents to just sit down and listen is you start, pull, you start posting math, mental math problems. Cause they're all saying, why can't kids just memorize their facts? Why can't they memorize their facts? So he'll, he'll get them going and say, Seth, just shout out answers when you have them. It'll go seven times eight you know, nine times six, and he'll hit all of them in their wheelhouse. You can see all the parents getting real competitive. And then he'll say 14 times nine. And the place just goes dead silent because they only learned up to 12. They, once it is past that memorization, they have no opportunity when it's really just, I would do it as nine times 10 plus nine times four is 36, right? So it's, and, and you know, so it's like you're saying this idea of when I'm holding up my hand, all five fingers are out. This is nine. This changes the game. This is now beyond counting. This is me thinking about when I need to borrow, I need to add eight more in. That's add 10 minus two. So it's, I, I, I love that. I absolutely love that well, activity. And I even like, so they're rebranding it. And I mean, I don't know if this is universal, but they talk about decomposition of numbers, but it just, as you were talking about, Ken, the idea of the number system being base 10, that that is the most powerful number to understand. So if you can break it down into that, and, and it's such a silly thing, but simply taking that understanding and what you're saying is, oh, how far am I away? So I add it here so that I can take it away later, or I take it away here to add it later. That exchange, almost like we talked about in algebra, okay, I could add 25 to both sides. It doesn't change the value. But if it allows my brain to understand it faster, um, it's it's fascinating. It, it reminds me, I don't know if you feel this way, but uh, just, you know, I'll say sensei because you just taught us something. But um, this is the most we've learned in a hundred and some uh, podcasts of like, wow, my, main, my brain is uh, like swirling a little bit of like, hey, it's straightforward, but... I never thought of it this way. I don't remember. I don't know if you had this experience, Ken, but learning the value of pi in high school, um, and maybe at this point it's a middle school skill, but I went through this whole process and we tried to define why pi was 3.14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how it was related to the, the size of a circle. And the entire classroom had absolutely no clue what we were doing. We could do the mathematics of it and punch it into a calculator. But did I understand what that symbol stood for? No, I could just tell you what it was. And I feel like that's a huge disservice to math and, and where we're going um, in education in general, that this simple activity immediately changes that understanding, the value, the the basis, the the pattern behind it, like we're referring to, because a lot of times, as we mentioned before, that curse of knowledge, um, you know, that that teacher that was standing in front of me just sp spouted off as if he knew, but didn't deliver it in a way that necessarily we received and, and ingrained. 
Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I just wanted to add it up those things since I have teaching many grade of the children, like at four years old, all the way to the high school. And then I even teaching the adults and then grandparents. The point is, it's not, doesn't have to be teaching them the very high, you know, like, a, the, the, like you said, 3.14, why that is explained to it's needed to you for the rest of your life. You don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> what you really need it is just simple calculation. Like, you know, Keynes once said, you know, like uh, many people know nine times seven, six times four, 22 times nine. But again, once you're going to be on the point, 148 times nine was 13, 39 plus times two. People said, and even my students said the same thing sometimes. You know, since I know 12 times 12, okay, how much is that? 144. Oh, good, good for you. How about this? 13 times 14. I don't know. <laughs> so then I always said one digit times one digit has to memorize. This is no, no, you must memorize. But once you go into the two digit, two digit, three digit, you can calculate. You know, same thing. Two digits divided by one digit, you can divide it like at 28 divided by four. Yes. But once you go into the 284 divided by four, you need to calculate it, you know? So that calculation skill is the basic of everything. But the school, each school, each teacher has a different way of the teaching. I respect that. And then in this country, especially me, I observing so many, you know, different way, including myself, I became a three children with a, you know, like a mother, but my children were already older enough. But I went through that their learning system said, why you explain so much to, you know, like, uh, then the end of the day, like, uh, if the teacher explains so much of the hours, if they get it, it's great. But if they don't get it, if they don't chew it, if they don't use it, that is a teacher's time was wasted, right? So that is uh, something I have been really observing. And then now I just simply taught you nine plus nine. Nine plus eight, nine plus seven. What do you have to do? Just, you know, if you cannot take away, take away, add. The only number you have to deal with 10 or five. That's the only number we have to deal with it. Regardless, you calculating the ones or tens or hundred thousand, it does not matter. And once those simple calculation system is ingrained in your head, it became a pattern. And those pattern can, you know, like a, fly away without needing those, you know, like actual bees to calculate. So for our teachers that are listening to this and maybe even, well, I would say any grade level, but teachers that are obviously uh, working with math or even teachers that are listening for their own children, is there any resources or things that we can use, especially if we're not geographically located near you to learn this or even uh, just the, the hand exercises that we're doing to use with our own kids to help them build that foundation a little bit. You know, um, I, I created myself for the online, uh, just self, you know, like alarm method program. I, I have is like you said, you know, I located in the Pacific, you know, side. So, you know, Portland, Oregon, it's just, it's not going to be sometimes working for the, you know, like a, taking the classes, live lessons. But I have uh, already, you know, self-learn online classes. So if people are interested in, they can just go there and then digging into, that might be the helping. And then sometimes even I tell my student parents, if you do not understand, just ask us, don't try to Google it. Don't try to go to the YouTube because there is so many different ways to teach. But my word to all the people is if you really wanted to teach your child mental calculation through the abacus way, you should learn someone who already know the mental calculation from the abacus. Okay. Abacus learner does not mean that they can do the mental calculation without using the abacus. That's not true. 
Okay, like me, I speak Japanese. Doesn't mean I can teach Japanese. No. Okay, so that is the same thing. It's that people sometimes, oh yeah, I know how to use abacus, but does not mean the person already know how to do the anza, which is take it off the abacus to calculate it. Interesting. So, can I just understand about the the school?、Um, I'll try to.、Uh, maybe I'll ask a few questions. So, you mentioned you have young kids all the way to grandparents.、Um, how do are people coming to you during a normal school day after school? How does that run? After school, after、okay. school,、so、during、like、the school times, yes, supplement, yes, so it, supplement. It, And that's fantastic that a kid that you know could develop their their number sense better comes to you and、um, benefits from that. About how long is a student coming to you? Like, is there a time frame that they start? They almost develop mastery, like fluid fluidness with abacus and their number sense. And as you mentioned, their confidence zooms from there. Is there a an average amount of time they're spending with you? Average of the time usually like three years, two to three years. But the some children, some children like I have a right now is a high school junior. He had been with me since kindergarten. So you can imagine the person's brain is just like a calculator. The moment you get the number, it's not the number for them at all. It's just already you know swallow it and they just already digest it and they already got the answer. So you, he even does not even spend the seconds to calculate. It for him is already in, inputted to the data somewhere, and then already starting going, you know, like one after another. So it's to me again, this is a skill. You learn it, you keep it, but the multiple years to train will be in a completely set of the skill. It's like a fine line to be inside your brain to me. That's fascinating to me. I, I wish that you were not on the West Coast because something like that is like a, a to have that access. Whether you're strong with number sense or not, I mean, that's the whole destination of math. Is the the answer is probably not going to change naturally with math. It's the how quickly you can deliver yourself to it, and and can you speak to what it stands for, which is just fascinating. Because I wasn't when when you talked about the school, I wasn't sure if it was a replacement or an additional.、Um, I would love to see. Do you have groupings? Like, is it one of those things that like early exposure are coming at the same time, or is it just a a mixed room? So how we do is like a first we have the like a black you know like a like a martial art. We have the level. The lowest level is a fifteen, and then going to fifteen, fourteen, thirteen. Twelve all the way to the one. Once you hit the one, then black belt, like you know, like a martial art. So the youngest children, not the youngest, the beginners. Like let's say if Matt and the Ken, if you are joining into my classroom, even though you already adult and already experienced, but you have to coming into my beginners class to teaching teaching you how to hold a focus, how to calculate, because we just you know particularly using only two fingers. Only thumb and the index finger. That's all we use to calculating all those beats. And then once then we have only three formulas, which I already told you. One formula, which is carrying the ten, and the next one is we have using the five. And then after that, five and the ten. That's all. That's the only formula you have to learn. Once you understand that three formulas. You can calculate addition, subtraction. Once you understand the subtract, much addition, subtraction. Next things is you just quickly going to the multiplication. And then once you're done, because multiplication is you know again repeated addition. As long as the children memorize the times table, just so easy. Boom, 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 adding. And then, then once they understand the addition part, and then going to the division. Once the children understand that those four formulas, and then ready to run. So now I am the one usually upper grade. I'm the one started to training them how they can be, you know, like a 
you know, being accurate of the numbers. Because in order to be good, like a like an Olympic swimmer, you know, they were starting from the just, you know, like a baby, you know, swimming, swimming student to start. But again, they are not going to be sitting on those, you know, small duck ponds. They're going to the moving up, moving up, and started the training. That's what I do. I am training the, those children to be more efficiently calculate to form many, so many bigger numbers, smaller numbers, or in you know, a more complex numbers. Once they are already well trained, they are good to go. They can just fly away. Can I ask? I that? will say that. I, I, Matt, I think I beat you on all those problems, so I might yeah. be ready for the yellow belt. You're still in the white belt. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess my my question is: you mentioned once they have a, a baseline understanding of addition and subtraction, they're ready for multiplication and division. Does the abacus method that you teach uh, deal with only whole numbers? Like I'm thinking a division problem that would not go. Um, Imperfectly, like a 29 divided by 7 would be 3 remainder 1 type scenario. Is that represented at all in, sorry, 4 remainder 1? Oh my goodness. You can tell it's summer brain when we're recording this. Is that something that's represented in the abacus or is it really demonstrating whole numbers? Can I take a guess at your answer? I'm going to guess yes. I'm going to guess yes, it is because you're just going to work back you're just going to work back you backwards in terms of place value because it's just age place value is just one tenth of a whole number. No, I mean, we, we do, we do uh, holding to the record, we uh, calculating as a remainder and we continuously keep calculating. In fact, we also even do the square root, calculating the square root. I mean, it's again, remember Matt and Ken, all the, complex of the calculation is boiling down to the four element of the calculation. That's it. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. How you formulate it is your turn. But once you know basic, this basic is the key of the success. You know, uh, this is something I just wanted to share with you that, you know, like, uh, because I have been teaching 23 years. It means I have so many already, you know, like a student who went to the, you know, like a real life. And then right now, this student, he is in the Vanderbilt uh, Junior. And he just visited me at the end of the May. And then he gave me this word. I just wanted to read it for you. Sensei, I have two words for you. Perseverance and the discipline. These are the lessons I learned from you and the gems. You have played a pivotal role in shaping the person I am today. The dedication and the hard work instilled in your classroom have made all my achievements possible. During my final round of interviews, the interviewers were amazed at how quickly I breezed through the mental math in business problems, proudly showing off my ability to solve them faster and more accurately than anyone else. The abacus and the skill I acquired during my childhood strengthened my com- commitment to focus, hard work, and made working with the numbers second nature to me. As I reflect on my journey, I realize the importance of self-discipline and organization qualities that will gratefully shape my professional path. My student gave me this word, the end of the, actually in a month ago, he visited me. He is in, now in an internship at, you know, uh, uh, where is it? He, yeah, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, Geroit. He is in the Geroit and then doing the internship. And then, you know, that made me really, you know, made me something, wow. I think I gave them the light, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, you should, get... be really, you, <laughs> you should be really proud of that. And <clears throat> and you had just a couple minutes ago correlated to like training like a sport. And, you know, I think sports and coaches, so many of those words used, perseverance and discipline, give you those same skill sets. And there's so much that I think I have in the character of who I am that I learned through sports. And 
reality is, is sports isn't for everyone. Get those same things out of dedicating yourself to an instrument or to an art or in this sense into, you know, training and, and the discipline of, of number sense, you're going to get that, that same thing. So I think that's, I think that's really powerful. So I, this conversation has been absolutely fascinating to me. I, I, I've loved it. So I want to, I want to jump into our exit ticket and we've modified it a little bit here to, uh, to, to fit you into, to wrap this conversation up in a positive way. So to kick things off, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Can you say it again, please? What What do you think the best thing a teacher can do to make a a student, a, a, not even school experience, just their life experience better? What's the best thing we can do as a teacher for our students? Give them the confidence. Fun, fun activity. But again, it's uh, to me, it's giving them the confidence. Giving them the confidence is about giving them the life to me. That's wonderful. What is the best piece of advice that you received? And it might have been from a colleague, supervisor, or even a student. You know, this is a, it's really something people might have said, huh? But I wanted to tell you, the word I received, the best advice was, it's okay. It's okay. The reason was, when I came here 31 years ago, I was a student. I studied so hard to get the A plus, <laughs> but my score was 99. I wasn't 100. And the way I come from was 100% is one only A plus. 99 is not the A plus. I was so disappointed. But the teacher gave me the word, Miwako, it's okay. You did the great job. I said, really? It's okay. That was really, really after, you know, all eight, you know, all year comes, especially now my age and I became a teacher. I recognized it's okay. It's, it's okay. It sounds like a little bit, you know, like a not really important, but the it's okay means it's okay. You did a great job. Acceptance, you know, to me is a, the teacher gave me the, you know, she understood I studied so hard, but I understand. So that, that it's okay made me felt, oh, okay, I am accepted. I was okay. I did it great. It's, it's okay made me so many words to me at the end of the it gives, day. It gives grace. And I think it's important for teachers to remind themselves it's okay if your lesson didn't go perfect or you didn't knock it out of the park that day, or maybe even interacted with a student in a way that you would want to change. And it's important for our kids to hear. And I, I see this doing with my own children too. My, my older two are starting to get, getting to the age. So my oldest is five and, and then the next one, she's three and a half. Like they're starting to make mistakes. And I'm saying, you can't do that. Right. And then they look at me and they start to get upset. I said, no, 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 it's okay. You never learned in your entire life now, what you just did is bad. I'm now telling you, so now you've made the mistake and it's okay. Just don't do it again. If you do it again, then that's a different, that's a different piece, but right. It's okay. You did that. Now, you know that that will create a negative result. So now you know that it's not okay, but this time it is okay. So I'm going to modify our last question here. What is the most important? So this, I think this is going to be hard for you to, to boil it down. Maybe not. What is the most important foundational skill for students to learn in math? To me, it's not only math, but I, as a miracle from Japan, it's a respect, appreciation. That is all boiling down to be a good student and a good person. Because no matter, like, again, it was very great to, you know, discuss about this subject with both of you that, you know, you have your way of the understanding. You have the way of the learning. I have the way of the learning. It's nothing wrong with all of our opinions. But the matter of open mind yourself to respect what other 
people, like in this case, like Matt and Ken, both of you are giving me the, you know, like opinions. I said, wow, that is a great idea. Because I have a respect to both of you. And I also have an appreciate to both of you. So that gave me that, you know, more open-minded to be become a great success for overall. That is a great, great answer. Um, we have been so privileged to have a few moments with you to talk about something that, you know, I... I have just thoroughly enjoyed how can our audience stay in contact with you, maybe continue to learn from or with you? Um, do you have access, maybe information about a website or social media that they can continue to learn? Along yes, I have a website. It's uh, jamsportland.com, J-A-M-S, portland.com. Or well, maybe you can just Google Miwako. Abacus, Portland. I'm sure it will pop it up, me. At the same time, you know, I really, I have a dream. I really would like to share this to all of you, many of you. I really, I believe Abacus became a sushi. You know why I'm saying? 31, 31 years ago, I came here as a student. That time, I even couldn't speak English this much well. But my question was always the same. People ask me, so what kind of food do you like? And then that time, 31 years ago, I said, I love sushi. And do you know what the people react 31 years ago? Oh, my God, disgusted. <laughs> Yuck. That was 31 years ago. But look now. Go out. Just, you know, you can find one after another. Sushi, sushi, oh, yeah. sushi, sushi, mm -hmm. sushi. Even the grocery store sells a sushi. <laughs> yeah, then, I was going to say maybe even some gas stations. <laughs> I know. And then once they find it out, are you Japanese? That, yes, I am. Oh, my God, I love sushi. <laughs> now, 31 years later, sushi, yak sushi became, oh, my God, I love sushi. It's fascinating to me. Okay, so why not Abacus? Abacus also, I always believe only one person. I'm the one. I even didn't think I can teach. But again, luckily, I started to teach. I started to share my skill 23 years ago from my old house, studying with two students. And now I've been teaching over thousands of the students. And I have a class over, you know, 150 students teaching. My goal is if I can teach the teachers like you, if I can teach the teachers, those teachers can teach 25 students. And then those students can say something to another teacher, another friend. And then maybe another teacher said, hey, hey, Matt, where did you learn these things? I, was, I wanted to learn. That's slowly to spread it out to the world. I really, I really, I'm very, you know, like a, I, I have a passion about one person can do, cannot do changing everything, but the one person can do something can changing slowly to gradually spreading in the world. So, right. So if anybody would like to learn something to trying to do changing anything, just send the email. And I, I'm really, I, I, again, one person knocking in the school district cannot change. But because so many teachers, you know, gathering together to do something, it can change the world. Right? I really, you know, very simple thing. Very simple thing. But we just have to start at one point. And there could be, this is a point. Thank I love that. Yeah, me. we will we will link up to your website. And if it's okay with you, I'll also put your email in our show notes so people can reach out directly to you which you can find on our website at poweredu.com or wherever you're watching or listening to this, you can just scroll down and, and you'll see it in the description there at the bottom. So Milwaukee, I can't, I can't thank you enough. This has been, this will without a doubt be one of my most memorable podcasts that we've, we've done in a 137 shows. Now this was fascinating to me. I love the purpose of it. I love what it's doing for students in a mathematical sense. Math has always been a, a passion of mine, like I said. So uh, I, I really just can't thank you enough. 
And for those of you listening, if you didn't get any of the visuals, again, I would encourage you jump over to YouTube and just go to that spot where we were, where Matt and I were racing for our, our abacus uh, mental math. So thank you again so much. You're welcome. Thank and you. we will continue to advocate for abacus to be the new sushi as well. Thank you. I'm going to give you both of your A plus. Good job. We'll take Thank it. You. I had one error. I had that 99%. Ken may have had the 100. So. <laughs> but as we power down this episode, you have left us feel empowered up. Thank you so very much and uh, Thank you. Uh, for the work that you're doing. And for our audience, stay well. And we look forward to talking to you next week. See you then. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators who are making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.